When we discussed the use of standard candles as a method of measuring distance, one thing that we noted is that the greater the brightness or luminosity of the object that we were looking at, the more distant this object can be and we'll still be able to detect it. So if I have a brighter standard candle, I'm going to be able to see it from farther away and therefore use it to measure greater and greater cosmic distances. So one thing that we might ask is, what are the brightest objects that we see in the universe and can these objects be used as standard candles? And one set of extremely bright objects occur when a star explodes at the end of its life and turns into a supernova. Supernova. So a lot of you have probably heard this term supernova before, but we're just going to briefly recap what happens during the course of a supernova. So let's start with a picture of a star during the normal course of its life. So we have our star, the outer layers, and we have some central core where all of the fusion reactions take place. And in this core, there are really two main forces at work. There's the gravitational force, which is pulling inwards, trying to make this core collapse. And there are the outward pressure forces that are produced from the extremely high temperatures that are caused by all of the fusion reactions that are taking place in this core. So during most of the life of the star, it's happily burning away hydrogen, and depending on how massive the star is, it can burn helium or heavier elements. But eventually, this star is going to run out of fusible material in its core. So these fusion reactions are going to stop, there's no more heat being produced, so these pressure forces are going to fail. And what will happen then is this core will rapidly collapse to a, a fairly small size, and when it does that, the huge densities and pressures and temperatures that are resulting from this gravitational collapse are going to allow a whole new set of nuclear reactions to occur. And these reactions will actually take the outer layers of the star, these outer layers, so this is all of the stellar material that was surrounding the core, and it will take these layers and push them off and out into space sometimes at up to 10% the speed of light. So this is an incredibly energetic detonation. And we can actually see these, uh, this expanding cloud of stellar debris in our telescopes. These are two Hubble images of these supernova remnants, these outer layers of the star that are expelled into space. So we can see that these events are incredibly energetic and they turn out that they're incredibly bright as well. But the question still remains, can we use them as standard candles? Because in order to use an object as a standard candle, we have to know very precisely what its brightness is. So do we know what the brightness of these supernovas are? So in order to try to answer this question, we want to start by looking at supernova that occur in relatively nearby galaxies, or galaxies that are close enough that we've been able to accurately measure their distances using, say, the Cepheid variable method. So we know the distance to the supernova and we can determine how bright it actually is. So what we have here is a number of light curves of different supernova. And so on the y-axis we have the absolute magnitude, which is an astronomy measure of the luminosity. And on the x-axis we have the number of days that have passed. And just for kind of comparison, since we've been talking about luminosity more than magnitude, this luminosity of negative 19 up here corresponds to about 3 billion solar luminosity. So 3 billion times the brightness of the sun. And down here, this corresponds to about 300, or sorry, 30 million solar luminosity. So again, these objects can be billions of times brighter than the sun. But what we notice is that there are a lot of different types of supernova and they'll have very different light curves. Some of them will be dimmer but last for longer, some of them will be brighter. And in between most of these types there can be a lot of individual variability. Sometimes these graphs will be stretched out and take longer or a shorter amount of times, sometimes they'll be brighter or dimmer. So there's a lot of variability in how these supernova occur and that could be because maybe these stars started out heavier or had a slightly different composition. There's a number of things that could cause this variability. But when we're trying to use these objects as standard candles, variability is a big problem. 
Ideally, we would want our standard candles to have a very, very consistent brightness. And that way we can confidently say when we see a new one that we know what the brightness is. And most of these supernova types don't exhibit that kind of behavior. However, there is one exception. This type 1a supernova, this uh, thick black curve, actually does show very, very consistent behavior and is pretty much the same brightness each time you see one. And that is because this type 1a supernova has a very, very different mechanism that drives it. So we have a type 1a supernova. So in this system, instead of having the core collapse of a massive star, we start with a binary star system. So two stars that are in orbit around each other. And one of these stars has evolved into what we call a white dwarf, a white dwarf. And this is essentially what happens to stars if they don't have enough mass to actually form a supernova. They shed their outer layers and are left with this core that's often composed of carbon and oxygen. So the star wasn't heavy enough to burn these things and, and form a, a real supernova. And this star, instead of being supported by fusion, since it can't fuse these yet, is supported by something called the electron degeneracy pressure. And the details of it aren't that important, just to say that these stars, these white dwarfs, have to be less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun, or else that electron degeneracy pressure can't support the star anymore. Now, what happens in this system, we have this white dwarf and this, orb this other star that it's in orbit around, and this larger star will start to accrete material onto the white dwarf. It'll start to transfer some of its mass. The gravity of this will, will pull in these weakly bound outer layers of, of its companion star. And what that does is gradually increases the mass of, this, of the white dwarf. And as the mass increases, so do the pressures and densities inside of the white dwarf. And just before hitting this mass limit, the pressure is going to become high enough that the carbon will undergo rapid fusion. Now, in normal stars, when you have a fusion reaction that's running too quickly, that region of the star will heat up and expand, thereby reducing the density and thereby slowing down the rate of that nuclear reaction. But in this particular case, the electron degeneracy pressure that was supporting the white dwarf from collapsing now restricts it from expanding. So what you get is a runaway nuclear reaction, and in just a few seconds, a significant portion of the carbon of that entire star is going to fuse all at once, and it releases a tremendous amount of energy. Enough energy to completely tear apart the star, and at peak brightness, giving it a luminosity four billion times brighter than the sun. So a couple of things we notice for using this as a standard candle. First, the white dwarf, just before it explodes, is going to be at a very specific mass and have a very specific composition. So we can expect that through this method, these supernova are going to occur in pretty much the same way. And when we look at the light curves from these type 1a supernova, we get basically the same thing each time. Now, there are some differences that we can sometimes see. Sometimes this is a little bit brighter or a little bit dimmer, but that will often correspond with the duration of the supernova being a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. So we can try to account for that. So the result of this is that we have a fairly stable standard candle that is incredibly bright. And this allows us to be able to see this object hundreds of millions of light years away. So if we observe one of these very distant supernova and verify that it's actually the correct type of supernova, this type 1a, by looking at its light curve and the spectrum of the light that's coming off of the supernova, we can use this object as a method of measuring the distances to galaxies that are hundreds of millions of light years away. Now, just to finish off this video, in August of 2011, almost like exactly a year ago actually, 
in a relatively nearby galaxy, the Pinwheel Galaxy, which is about 21 million light years away, a supernova was actually observed. So this is the before picture, and you see that there's nothing really special going on over here. And in the course of just a few days, an incredibly bright object appeared. And it was verified that this is a type 1a supernova. And we see that it's actually comparable in brightness with the core of the galaxy. These are incredibly bright objects. And by observing these uh, lucky supernova that are very nearby, we can actually learn a lot more about it and better refine our techniques of using these as part of the cosmic distance ladder and better understand just how these supernovas work on their own. So that's, I think, kind of a striking example of how bright these objects actually are, going from not being able to see anything in particular there to this bright supernova.